We had the opportunity to uh, evaluate some of the data that are maturing from three very well-controlled clinical studies that have resulted in the registration of abrutinib as a new therapy for patients with chronic lymphocytic leukemia. The first was the Resonate study, where patients were randomized to receive abrutinib versus ofatumumab. And in that study, they showed that the uh, response rates and also the survival of patients treated with abrutinib was superior, allowing for the initial registration of that drug. Uh, the Resonate 2 study was patients um, who have not received prior therapy, uh, who were randomized to receive either ibrutinib versus chlorambucil as a drug. And that study also showed a, a significant improvement in response rates and survival in patients treated with ibrutinib. The third study was the Helio study, and that was where patients who had had prior therapies were treated with rituximab and the drugs bendamustine and rituximab, and they were compared against patients who had received only bendamustine, rituximab, and a placebo. So those three studies have data that we're now looking over and analyzing over time. Patients are in continuous follow-up, and so we have long-term follow-up data. Now really what this talk that we gave here yesterday was highlighting more recent analysis of those data. Uh, about 17 years ago, we had what was called the donor classification system. And what they noted was that patients could be stratified based on cytogenetics of their survival probability. And those patients who had leukemic cells that had deletions in chromosome 17, the short arm of chromosome 17, fared the least well and had a very poor survival after diagnosis than patients who did not have that. Uh, patients who had uh, leukemic cells where there was a deletion in the long arm of chromosome 11, the 11Q, uh, they had uh, not as bad a prognosis, but they had a worse prognosis than the other patients. And the patients that fared seemingly the best were ones that had maybe deletions in chromosome 13 or no detectable deletions. This was called a hierarchy. Namely, as you were diagnosed with CLL, you can have your cytogenetics examined. If you were a patient that had leukemic cells that had deletion, say, in chromosome 11, it was thought that uh, the prognosis might not be as good as if you did not have that. Now, we've recently updated this with the CLL Research Consortium, uh, and these are data that was assimilated by patients treated throughout the United States. And, and looking at over 1,000 patients, we looked at the outcome data and survival data of patients treated with this uh, chemoimmunotherapy regimens. And what was striking is that although the survival was improved and patients, the curves were shifted, so patients with even deletions in 17P were living longer, there was still this stratification and that the patients with deletion 17P were performing less well than the rest and patients of 11Q were performing less well than, than the rest as well. So I think that uh, the question we had was whether that same hierarchy applies to the newer targeted therapies. Uh, we looked at the data from the earliest studies that were the phase one, phase two studies of patients treated with abrutinib, and it appeared that the same hierarchy was there. Namely, you almost had the impression that, for example, patients with deletions in 11Q were not going to do as well as the rest. So we wanted to look at these data. Now, importantly, we have to mention that Two of these three studies that we assimilated the data on excluded patients with deletion 17P. And the reason for that is those studies were stratifying patients to receive either brutinib treatment-based regimens versus a chemotherapy-based regimen. And it was not considered wise to give chemotherapy to patients with deletion 17P. However, we still have the data on patients with deletions in 11Q, uh, patients with trisomy 12, patients who have leukemic cells that express unmutated antibody genes, which typically confer a worse prognosis than patients who have leukemic cells that express mutated antibody genes. And we also looked at patients who have complex cytogenetics. That's when you do the genetic analysis and find multiple uh, changes in the, in the chromosomes that is called complex. And we've actually become recently aware that those patients may not do as well, particularly with chemoimmunotherapy. Well, the results of the analysis actually have been quite surprising to us because looking only at the abrutinib treatment arms of the uh, three studies that I mentioned and having longer follow-up data over a median of 36 months, we can now start asking the question of how 
that do these risk categories stratify patients. And what was really striking to us is that patients with uh, trisomy 12 had a higher complete remission rate than the rest of the patients for reasons that are not explained. But the progression-free survival of patients with trisomy 12 versus without were virtually the same. Uh, patients who had unmutated antibody genes actually were faring similar to the patients with mutated antibody genes. There was not a significant difference yet that we can discern in progression-free survival. That was also true of patients who have uh, other factors such as deletion or complex cytogenetics, which was quite striking to me because I was anticipating that patients with complex cytogenetics might have a more adverse outcome and a shorter progression-free survival. It was interesting, too, on patients who had deletions in 11, uh, chromosome 11, rather than having a worse prognosis, they seemed to be doing better than patients who did not have deletion in chromosome 11. And this is quite striking. Now, the significant levels, it's trending towards significant. It's not significant yet, but it's really very interesting that patients with deletion 11Q are at least performing as well as patients who do not have that marker. And I've always told my patients, you know, don't consider this a bad prognostic marker or don't consider these other things as bad prognostic markers because the patient says, oh my gosh, I have bad disease, you know, somehow taking ownership of that. I always try to say, no, it's not bad disease for these markers. It just means perhaps bad therapy. And as we improve therapy, maybe we can change bad disease into good disease. And I think that's a lot more optimistic for our patients too. If we can figure out what makes something of a bad marker and fully dissect what's going on or try to develop new therapies that improve the outcome of those patients, uh, we can actually convert these uh, markers which then become only predictors of bad outcomes with certain forms of therapy. I must say that it's clear though that patients with deletions 11Q, it gives some room for thought in that if you have a prognostic marker or predictive marker for poor outcome with chemoimmunotherapy uh, and you don't seem to have that same prediction with some of the other newer targeted therapies, it gives you pause to say, maybe I should opt for the newer targeted therapies where there's not such a risk for a poor outcome as with chemoimmunotherapy.